Oh, got it. Um, we we'll maybe reshare the slides of uh, Daniel. I will reshare them. Um, I receive constant in slides. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I got it. Uh, I put the link later on. Yes. So maybe we put them closer to his talk so people don't get confused. Shall we start? Uh, thank you everybody for coming to this uh, new session of the One World Probability Seminar. Uh, we have the pleasure to have with us uh, Daniel Remenik, who is a professor at the uh, Universidad de Chile. And he will talk about the solution of the Purinocrea growth model. Thanks, uh, Aurelio. Thanks, Mimi, for the invitation. It's, it's great to be speaking in the seminar. Um, okay, so what I'm going to talk about today is uh, joint work with Konstantin Batetsky, who's going to speak uh, in the second talk, and with Jeremy Costell, and I'll jump right to it. So I want to talk about today about the polynuclear, polynuclear growth model, okay? And this is a pretty simple, I mean, not so simple, but it's, it's a relatively simple model for a randomly growing crystal, okay? So we're going to have a one-dimensional interface. So this is a one-dimensional crystal, randomly growing in time. And uh, probably the best way to explain it is with a, with a movie. So this is a wonderful simulation by Patrick Ferrari, which I'm going to uh, show you next. And with that, I'm going to explain uh, what the model is. Uh, okay, so you should be seeing a movie. Well, a still picture for now. Is it there? Yes, okay, good. So uh, I, I haven't started the movie yet, but uh, on the bottom here, this is the this red uh, interface. This is my height function of the PNG model. And the way it works is that it's an integer value. So it, it lives on R, but it's integer value. And you have these islands, okay, which expand to the right and to the left. So they just expand out at rate one. Okay, I'm gonna put the movie. Uh, and that's what you're seeing. So these islands are uh, expanding. And then, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, there it is. So the islands are expanding. And every time you have uh, two pieces which meet, they collide and they uh, basically merge. OK, so this is what's supposed to be happening uh, over here. I think you can see my mouse. Uh, but you, you can see in the movie that when two islands uh, collide, they meet. And then randomly. Uh, there's these nucleations. This is what's being shown by these uh, blue dots. And whenever you have a nucleation, a new little island uh, begins and it starts to spread uh, outwards, okay? So again, everything spreads outwards at uh, speed, deterministic speed one. And whenever two islands collide, they just merge. And then uh, according to this configuration of points, I haven't told you what they are yet, but they are a space-time Poisson process. Uh, uniform, I mean, homogeneous space-time Poisson process, uh, whenever you see one of these dots, there's a new nucleation, OK? So that's that's how, that, how it looks like. Maybe I should show it one more time. Uh, so that's that's how the model works, OK? I don't know if, if, if there are any questions about how the model is defined. Uh, it would be good if... if uh, a small question, what happens when uh, you have a, a, an island of size 2 hitting an island of size 1? It, the, the one of size two just takes over everything. Okay, here's just to, just to show what's going on. This is just basically a faster simulation. This has been run for a long time or alternatively, uh, there's more Poisson points 
uh, so it's it's as if uh, everything is running faster. Okay, so if you have there's no problem, you can start with an island of height two and another one of height zero, and what's going to happen is that the 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 one of height two uh, takes over. Okay, and this is the last part that I want to show. So this is uh, the in the earlier simulations what I showed was the flat initial condition. So you started with a flat interface, and then you have these nucleations uh, which start making these islands and, and they expand out. Uh, this is known as the droplet initial condition or the narrow wedge initial condition. So basically what we're doing here is we're restricting to this cone, okay? So this triangle and everything is happening only there. So I only allow uh, Poisson points to happen in, in that region. And then you run the process and you see this droplet shape starting to grow uh, with these fluctuations on top, okay? So we're going to be interested for a little bit in the slides uh, on this initial condition because it's 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 special. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the slides. I hope the definition is clear. So it's it's just what I said, nothing else. Uh, oh, I lost my slides. Good. Okay, so this is a model which uh, the first instances of the model appeared in in the seventies, I think. Uh, or at least versions of this in, in the literature of crystal growth. Then there's a paper by Gates and Westcott in 95, where they studied this uh, more mathematically. And then there's a pretty famous uh, paper by Michael Prahofer and Herbert Spohn, uh, I'm gonna mention it later, where they, where they really studied this process uh, in, in, in this version uh, in, in the way I'm gonna be interested in uh, for the first time. Okay, so, I want to stop for a moment to talk about this droplet initial condition. This is the narrow wedge initial condition, the last simulation that I showed. Okay, so I have this cone uh, over here. Okay. I don't know if you can see my mouse. Can you see it? Oh, good. Okay, so I have this, this shape here and you can think of this. So remember that now my nucleations are all happening inside this cone. And you can think of this as changing the initial condition of the, of the process in the following way. I start with height zero at the origin and minus infinity everywhere else, okay? So there's just this little island, uh, infinitesimal island at zero and everybody else is minus infinity. This looks bad, but actually it's, it's a very good initial condition in this process. And what's gonna start happening is that if you had nucleations outside, they don't matter because they're gonna nucleate on minus infinity and, and then I mean, you, you won't see anything anyway. But this uh, little island uh, that starts at zero, it's gonna start moving outwards and uh, that's the simulation we were seeing, okay? And in this picture, these blue dots are the, the, are the nucleations, okay? So these new islands that uh, sprout and these lines going outward, outwards, they're just simply the movement of these islands uh, outwards. And these crosses, they correspond to when two of these islands meet and they annihilate. So that, I mean, they don't annihilate. These lines annihilate, but what, the, what happens for the, for, the, for the islands is that they merge, okay? So this configuration actually corresponds to this height function that I drew uh, on the top. And you can sort of see that these, uh, these little interfaces, these curves define basically the, the height function. If I look, for, for instance, at this point, uh, this point corresponds to height four. And the reason it's height four is that it's, if I go back to the origin, I see exactly four lines in the middle, okay? If I go, uh, I don't know, here, I only see one line in the middle on my way to go to the origin and that that corresponds to uh, height one okay so now suppose i want to uh, look just for to, to fix ideas let me look at the origin okay i want to uh, say something about the height at the origin so if i want to look at the height at the origin uh, you can see that all that matters is what happens inside this backward slide cone if you want this this square right because any nucleations that were happening outside, they won't reach me anyway, okay? So I only have to look at those. And inside the square, so this is a square, you can compute the area of the square. And it turns out that there, the, the number of dots that you see inside is gonna be a Poisson random variable, simply because I have a Poisson space-time process of, uh, of nucleations. Okay, so it's a Poisson of, of rate of parameter t squared. There's six points in this picture. And you can notice the following thing. So now I wanna sort of rotate and, and I want to look at this on this x and y uh, coordinates. And now think about ranking these coordinates by order. 
okay? Both in X and in Y. So for instance, this dot has the lowest coordinate in X and the, <laughs> I guess I made a mistake here. Oh, no, no, sorry, this, this line shouldn't be there. That's, that's a typo, so that little dot shouldn't be there. So this is the first one, and that's the second one on the Y coordinate, right? Uh, this dot corresponds to the second one on the X order and the third one in the, in the Y order, right? I, I, I should have moved this to there. So that's a little type of the one. But you can order this thing in this way. And if you, uh, if, if you think of this about a, a, as a permutation, then what you see is that one went to two, two went to three, three went to five, and so on. So what this is defining for me is a, a random permutation, okay? And in, it's a permutation in this case of six points. Okay, so I think we'll hear the, I mean, I, I, this is the permutation that corresponds to this configuration. And here is this uh, very famous observation that, well, maybe it's not so famous, but um, many people know about it, and, and it's, it, it, it's important in, in this story, uh, that the height function at the origin, in this case, it's exactly the same as the length of the longest increasing subsequence in my permutation, okay? So if I want to go from this point to that point, then I have to sort of start collecting these points. This is really uh, Poissonian last passage speculation, if you have heard about those things. Uh, but you can check that really this path that makes me go from the origin to this point at T uh, corresponds exactly to this uh, increasing subsequence in my permutation, okay? There's another one. Here I could have taken two, three, four, and, and six, okay? But the longest one is four, and that's, that's the, um, that's the same thing, okay? So we have connected this problem, at least, and in the case of the narrow wedge initial condition, with uh, the, uh, the problem of uh, the longest increasing subsequence in a uniform, in a random permutation, uh, which has a length, which is uh, random, it's a Poisson random variable, uh, but it's uniformly chosen, okay? And this is a very famous problem. Uh, so it, it got the name of Ulam's problem. Uh, and Ulam's problem was the problem of determining how this length grows, okay? So uh, in the early 70s, Hammersley proved that this uh, longest increasing subsequence grows like root n. So now I'm thinking that n is fixed, not Poisson. So take, take a uniformly chosen random permutation of length n. Uh, as n grows, so the length tends to grow like root n. So this is just a consequence of the Stodarity de Godic theorem. Uh, with some speed c, okay? And it was an open problem for a while to determine the, that speed. And then Logan and Shep and Bershik and Kerov uh, checked that c equals two, okay? By very complicated, basically algebraic uh, arguments. And then about 20 years later, uh, Aldous and Diakonis and independently Timo Sepalainen uh, got uh, what one could call a, a soft, soft argument, hydrodynamic type limits argument uh, to show that the speed is two, okay? Good. So what we are going to be more worried about is the fluctuations. So now I want to see what, how this length fluctuates around this predicted place two root n, okay? And the, the result, the relevant result here is the, the result by Byte, Dyke, and Johansson from 99. Uh, oops, that's, that's what I wanted to do. Again, okay, Bike, Dyke, and Johansson, 99, they proved the following thing. So this is a very, very famous result, which in a way uh, marks the start of uh, a big part of all this story, is that this, uh, this rescaled uh, longest increasing subsequence converges in distribution to something called the Tracy Whedon GUE distribution. So that's the distribution of the largest eigenvalue of a certain random matrix. It's a Gaussian or Mission random matrix. You look at, at the largest eigenvalue, you, you rescale uh, that, uh, that eigenvalue, you get to something called the Tracy Williams distribution, and that's the limit. Okay? So this is back from 99. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, so, in a way, this marks the beginning of, of the story. So very quickly, this proof, the proof uh, by Bike, Dykes, and Johansson was based on, some, on a formula by Gessel uh, using a toplitz determinant and a very complicated uh, Riemann-Hilbert analysis, at least com complicated for me. And then there was a lot of work around this. So in particular, there's, a, there's another proof 
uh, slightly later by Johansson, uh, which uses a freedom determinant formula that's going to be closer to what I'm going to be discussing here. And then there's lots of names and lots of work, and I, I wouldn't be able to cite everything uh, perfectly. Okay. So let me rewrite this very uh, briefly in terms of our problem. Okay. So the problem I was interested in was this height function for this PNG processor. It's schematically here. I start this thing running from this uh, droplet initial condition. I run it for some time. I see something. And now suppose I stand here at X and I want to see um, what, what are those fluctuations. Well, what I have just told you, it was at the origin, but actually I can move X without much problem, problem because uh, all that happens when I move X is that I change the area of the square that I was showing you. Okay, so now this area is going to be T squared minus X squared. I have a Poisson a random variable with this uh, rate. And the bike die to Hanson theorem, what it would translate to is what I just wrote here. So if I look at this height function and I take T to infinity in this V scaled way, uh, I get to this Tracy Williams distribution. Okay. Uh, I want to mention briefly that uh, there's work from a couple of years after. Uh, which corresponds to the flat initial condition, the first simulations that I showed you. And in that case, so th this, is a, this is a result by bike and brains uh, from a one. Uh, so if I do it in that case, well, now everything is flat. So I, I don't really have to worry about who is X. And I still get convert. I mean, again, I get convergence to a random matrix uh, distribution. In this case, it's the Tracy Whedon GOE distribution. So now it's the largest again, the rescale fluctuations of the largest eigenvalue of now a real symmetric uh, Gaussian matrix. Okay, so this is this is a famous connection of uh, longest increasing subsequence problem with uh, random, sorry, with random matrices. Okay, so to, to get a little bit closer to the story that I want to tell uh, today, so let me go back to the narrow wedge case. So I'm still in the narrow narrow wedge case, and Consider the following quantity. So now again, I'm going to look at this probability, exactly the probability I was looking before, but without rescaling. Okay, so the probability that the height function at time s, and I'm going to stand at the origin because everything is. Uh, I want to look at one point distributions. Everything has this uh, symmetry that I, if I move x, I just change uh, somehow the t, t squared becomes t squared minus x squared. And I define this uh, distribution function f, and there's a result which, again, sort of in the physics literature, goes back to the early '90s, and then it appears in in a couple of places, particularly in, in a paper of Alexei Borodin from '01, uh, that you can define a certain alpha. So the details here are not really important, but there's a there's a function alpha, that there's a there's a sequence alpha, but it, it's really a function. It depends on f such that alpha is related to this f, to the distribution function in the way that I just uh, wrote there. And the alpha satisfies something called the discrete parallel two equation, which is this equation that uh, it's being written here. Okay, So this discrete parallel two equation is an equation in integral systems. It's, it's well known in that world. Uh, and it's by now, it's not a surprise maybe, but, but it is a little bit of a surprise that in a problem like this, or it was, you can get this. Now, this, this didn't really come out of the blue uh, because the reason this is interesting for us is that uh, there's also connection to this pi level two equation, but now not the discrete, uh, but instead the continuous pi level two equation for the limiting fluctuations of the problem. So remember the limiting fluctuations are given by this Tracy William GUE distribution. And for the Tracy William GUE distribution, uh, there's a formula where the distribution is given by this. This formula is the formula uh, due to Tracy and Whedon from their paper 1394. Uh, that this distribution is given by e to minus the integral of something, this q. Uh, and this q, what it is, it's a certain special solution of the Pi-Levitt 2 equation, this ODE. Okay, which again, it's a very famous uh, ODE in integral systems. And this discrete by level two equation is a discretization. It's not completely obvious, but it's in a way in, in, in the integrable world, uh, in, or in, in, in the subject of uh, integral systems, uh, this is a natural uh, discretization because it's still integral. Uh, okay, I haven't said what integral means, but I, I, I hope it's gonna start becoming a little bit clear later. So what is R in the integral? What is R? <clears throat> Is ah, R, R is a typo. R is 
X. It should be X. X. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Yes. So actually, R in X here is continuous. This is an R. I was using it for a, for the discrete quantity. So yeah, it's, it's just a type. Okay. So I'm gonna tell you now what's uh, the main result that I want to show today, which is sort of a version of this, but in general. Okay. So th there's this there's this differential equation or this discrete difference equation being solved in the narrow wedge case, and what we wanted to do is see if we could say something uh, in more generality. Okay. So <clears throat> here is the result. The result is the following. So now I'm going to take P and G, starting with a general initial condition. Okay, so I won't tell you the, the initial condition. Remember, it's just an interface which lives on the reals and it takes values on the integers. Uh, it can take uh, value minus infinity, that's not a problem. Okay, because I, I want to think about these uh, functions as upper semi continuous functions and minus infinity is okay. So, in particular, this covers the case of the narrow wedge initial condition. And I define again uh, this distribution function. So now h, the h0 is fixed. And what this is asking is I have my height function, h of t, and I fix on x, and I ask what's the probability that that height is less than r, okay? So that's just the one point distribution of this function. I also need to introduce something which just, just be, if you want for technical reasons, I need it, not really technical. I need to define r0 of t comma x. This is gonna be the term, the, it's the soup, but it's just the deterministic part of the dynamics. So if you see that, you should imagine that I run my dynamics without any Poisson process. I just run the deterministic part where these islands uh, expand and merge, and I let R0 of t comma x be the corresponding height. And the theorem is the following. So this is, this is joined uh, with Constantine and with Jeremy. It's still in progress, um, but hopefully to be posted very soon. Uh, so the result we have is that f, so this distribution function, uh, satisfies something called the 2D Toda equation. Okay, so for positive t and for r above this, uh, this r zero that I introduced, uh, this is the equation that f satisfies. Okay, so the 2D Toda equation is another uh, equation which is completely integrable, um, and Okay, most of you probably, at least a lot of you will not have ever seen this uh, equation. Uh, many of you will not have seen uh, the one that I'm writing here either, uh, but this is, this is a little bit more well known and it's very well known in the world of integral systems. So the, the Torah lattice, okay, the one dimensional version. And this is what you get if you do exactly the same thing that I'm doing, uh, but you do the flat case. So now suppose you start with H0 being flat, the first simulations that I showed you. If you do that, then since the process is sort of homogeneous in space and my initial condition is homogeneous in space, then F is independent of X. And this derivative here drops out. And if I make this change of variables, G, I define it like this, then I get this uh, G double prime uh, equals E to the GR plus one minus GR minus E to, so the G minus GR minus one. This is the famous total lattice equation, okay? So in the particular case of uh, flat initial data, uh, we get the total lattice. So, so before trying to comment a little bit about this, uh, let me tell you that there's also a version for the multipoint distributions of P and G, okay? So now instead of looking at one point, I'm gonna look at several points at a time, okay? What's the probability that at the coordinates XI, I'm below RI at time T? I give this function a name, okay? So there's T, there's the X's and, the, and there's the R's, and I need this notation. Uh, so I'm gonna compute some derivatives. So this DT plus X derivative means I compute the derivative with respect to T and I add all the derivatives with respect to all the X's. And if I put a minus, it means I, I just subtract the ones with the minus. R here is uh, the vector of R's, the heights that I'm looking at in, in my function. And if I write R plus one, it just means that I'm adding one to everywhere. And okay, here is the multipoint version. It's a little bit more complicated. So one way to state it is the following, uh, is to say that there's a matrix Q. So this is a function, but it's a matrix valued function, which is invertible, which does two things. So number one, if you compute the determinant, 
of this matrix Q, you get this ratio of the S. Okay, and number two, Q, Q is a matrix value function. It satisfies something called the non-abelian 2D toad equations, which is this relatively complicated uh, equation written uh, on the bottom. Okay, so what this is saying is there's a Q, maybe I should say right now, Q, Q is really explicit. Okay, the way I'm writing it here, I'm saying there is a Q, but actually we know what Q is. That's how we prove it. So there's a Q which evolves in this way. Okay, and then if you, if you were able to compute it, you take the determinant of that matrix and you get back uh, this thing that you are interested in. Okay. Sorry, in the first, in the first term, what is differentiated? Uh, will the Q multiply Q minus one? How is possible? Uh, it's the first one is, so, so first this one, one is- Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, only that. Ah. Yes. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Like this. Okay, it didn't show up, but, but yes, only the first one, okay? And then, and that's why there's this parenthesis because the, the second derivative is, I mean, the, the derivative on the, the leftmost derivative is, is differentiating everything. May I also ask one thing, what is GL? QR is element of GL. Oh, no, of it's M. just invertible matrices of the general linear group of size n. It's okay, just, uh, yeah, okay. Invertible, I'm just saying this is an invertible matrix uh, and it should be because I'm computing inverses. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank so this looks like a very complicated equation and it is, but uh, it's again, it's an integrable system. So that's the first thing I'm writing here. So why should we care about this? And you, you, th there's several reasons, okay? But the first one is that uh, this is a classical completely integrable system, okay? So it's something that shows up, shows up in, in mathematical physics a lot, this sort of, um, these sort of equations, okay? Uh, so it's, it's interesting to see this connection in, 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 in this setting, okay? Uh, in per, so this particular one shows up in different places, okay? So it shows up in algebraic geometry, uh, in these generating functions for Hurwitz numbers, in the conformal maps for simply connected domains, in another uh, statistical physics model, okay? And in KPZ, it had actually also shown up uh, already uh, in something known as the multi-layer stochastic heat equation. Okay, so this is a paper of Neil O'Connell and John Warren. So they, in, in a setting which is not, I mean, it's, it's in the same world of, of KPZ models. I haven't really spoken about KPZ, but in the same world, uh, it had shown up for the multi-layer multi stochastic heat equation, but in a very different way. And there's, a, there's the quantum version of the total lattice, which also shows up in the Brownian directed polymer. But something I should say is that in, all those examples, there's really no analog at all of general initial data. So for instance, in the O'Connell Warren paper, the initial data, the, the, the context is very different, okay? But it's not, you can't really change the initial condition. There's one model with one equation uh, and, and there's not this family of solutions which, of, of the equation, uh, which have this physical meaning when you change the, the the, the solution, it means you change the initial condition. Okay, so in that sense, this is, this is new. Um, now, I mean, another reason to, 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 to be interested in this is simply what, why on earth should this happen? Like I have this complicated problem and this endpoint distribution satisfy a closed equation. There's really no reason in principle to believe that uh, that should happen, but it does. And uh, we have only partial explanations that the, the we don't really have a deep explanation. The explanation we have is that this is a this is an integral system, so it has lots of structure, and we can prove it. Okay, but it's 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 a big mystery still. Okay, but there's another reason to 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 be interested in this, which is uh, KPZ universality. So very quickly, what is KPZ universality? The KPZ universality class. It's a big class of models in one dimension, uh, including. But random growth models such as PNG, so PNG is one, directed polymers, interacting particle systems, there's SPDs, there's lots of things which conjecturally are in this universality class. And in this universality class, what should happen is that what it means for PNG is the following, okay? But it would mean the same for any model in the class. It means that if I know that my initial condition, the one that I'm putting there, converges in some sense, Okay, so if I take my initial condition, so think about this as my 
initial profile. I rescale it, uh, and the, the scaling here is diffusive, and I take epsilon to zero. If that converges uh, in, in some sense to a limiting profile, then if I rescale the evolution uh, with this little bit strange scaling, but uh, th this is known as the one, two, three KPZ scaling. So I have to rescale diffusively in space. Okay, so here is space X and there's an epsilon to the half. And then time has to be sped up uh, like, a, like the cube of, uh, of, of the scale so then in, in this cubic way. So there's one, two, three. Uh, and I, I also have to subtract the, 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 the first order growth of my interface. And if I do that, then that should correspond to that should converge to something called the KPZ fixed point. So what is the KPZ fixed point? The KPZ fixed point is the conjecture, if you want, or it's it's the the the, the process which should be the limit of any process in the KPZ universality class. Okay, so it's a Markov process. It's a Markov process of height. It's a little bit like in the simulation that I was showing you. You should imagine this height that was growing, looking at it from very far under the scaling, and then you're going to have these this evolution, and that evolution is, is, is this KPZ fixed point. It's called a fixed point because it's fixed under the scaling, under this one, two, three scaling. So just like Brownian motion is invariant under diffusive scaling, this one is invariant under this scaling, but it's the whole process, okay? Uh, so this was constructed, uh, we constructed with Constantine and Jeremy in a paper from a couple of years ago, although it appeared last year, uh, as a scaling limit of TASEP. Okay, a different process. And it's also constructed uh, a year or two later by Doug and Dorne, uh, Jan Shortman, and Dalin Vira uh, in a completely different way, starting from Brown and Las Passage population. And now this, this uh, convergence, okay, from a discrete model to the KPZ fixed point is known for a couple of models, okay? Not too many. You, need, you really need some formulas to, to be able to prove or at least some integrability, some, something to start with uh, to prove this convergence. Okay, but PNG belongs to the KPC universality class. So one expects, and actually it can be proved, we're gonna say it later, uh, that uh, for the PNG high function, uh, we should have convergence to this special uh, process called the KPC fixed point. And very quickly, I, I wanted to say that this convergence, so the convergence over here, uh, in the case of narrow wedge, so that's the, the last simulation that I showed, the one where it grows like a droplet, uh, this is what Prahofen and Spahn proved in the paper that I, that I quoted at the very beginning, okay? So if you fix, you, you look at this for fixed time, okay? So you don't look at the evolution, you just look at, the, at, at, this, profi at, at this profile in fixed time, but rescale, uh, it converges to something called the ARI2 process, which is a very basic process in, in this KPZ universality class. So that's, that's, a, that's a result uh, dating from 02, okay? And then some years later, Borlin, Ferrari, and Sasamoto uh, proved uh, something similar in the flat case, okay? So there's convergence to what corresponds to the right-hand side for fixed time and two special initial conditions, okay? So that was known. But, okay, I, I'm really, I really want to go back to this uh, non abelian 2D toda equation. So I have this one, two, three scaling, okay? And I, and I also know that this, this object here satisfies the 2D toda equations, the non abelian 2D toda equations. So what I can do is I can transfer the scaling to this uh, strange matrix Q and try to see if I can say something about the limit, okay? So if you, if you sit down and write it out, uh, it turns out that the way to transfer the scaling is to do this change of variable, to define this Q epsilon, this bold phase Q epsilon, uh, which is rescaled in the same one, two, three way. And, and the question would be, okay, what is the limit of this? Can, can I take epsilon to zero and get something meaningful? And the answer is the following. So here's yet another complicated equation. So and this, this computation is formal, so it, it's not rigorous. Uh, but it's still interesting in the following way. So this Q converges to a limiting matrix Q. It's still an N by N matrix. And this matrix Q satisfies the following. So you take Q and you take its derivative and Q together with its derivative satisfies another completely integrable equation. This is actually a PDE. Uh, 
code. Yeah, sorry, yes. So called the matrix KP equation, the matrix Kadomtsvet-Pedvashvili equation, okay? Uh, there may be a typo, but okay, but, but it's not uh, really relevant, okay? So you, you compute derivatives in R, computing derivatives in R here means summing all the derivatives in R, in X means summing all the derivatives in X, and you get this complicated, but again, completely integrable PD, okay? For this Q, for the limit of the Q, which corresponds to P and G. And it's reasonable to ask, okay, so what, what does this have to do with anything? Uh, so actually, th this is not surprising. Uh, in a way, it's not surprising, <laughs> at least from, in the KPZ, from the KPZ point of view. It's not surprising because uh, with Jeremy, we had proved a couple of years ago um, that if I do the same thing, so now I define my F as the multipoint distribution of the KPZ fixed point. So, this F is the analog of the F that I was looking at for P and G, but now for the KPZ fixed point. Then what we showed is that same sort of thing. There's a Q, uh, which is an invertible matrix, uh, which evolves according to this KP equation, to this matrix KP equation, and such that from Q, you can recover uh, F in this way. So the derivative of the logarithm of, the logarithmic derivative of F is the trace of Q. So remember, on the other side, we had these ratios of Fs were the determinant of Q, okay? Here, because of the scaling, uh, the scaling here on the top, uh, the determinant got linearized and we get a trace, okay? So, so this is sort of putting the two pieces together, you know? Uh, so th there's also, in, in the case of N equals one, uh, so if I look at the one point case, this matrix KP equation becomes the standard KP equation, which is this equation here, uh, which I guess still uh, most of you will not have seen before, but it's, it's the, so this matrix KP equation is the multipoint generalization of this uh, completely integrable PD. Uh, and if I go to the flat case, which was the simplest case for the total equation. Uh, so what happens in that case is that this derivative drops out and I only get this green part, and that's the KDD equation, okay? Which uh, some of you will have, or, or several of you will have heard about before, okay? So, so this is the KDD equation, which is uh, an equation for uh, waves in shallow, wave propagation in, in shallow, in a shallow canal. Uh, but, okay, that's what the equation was derived for, but there's no real connection that we know of between the two products. Okay, so again, we have th that Q, this Q here satisfies this non-abelian total equation and the non-abelian total equations converge to this KP equation, which is the thing that is satisfied uh, you know, in, in, in this way by the KP fixed point. Uh, this is not a proof of convergence of P and G to the KP equation. So remember, I, I was talking about so a little bit back, I was saying we expect this to happen. So the PNG model should converge to, to the KPZ fixed point. Uh, what I just told you about is not a proof because, uh, because this is formal, but actually uh, there, yes. Uh, this converges can be proved uh, in, in a different way. So there's at least two proofs not fully written down. Uh, so, so this one is basically written down, but there's a proof based on these techniques that use the directed landscape due to Doverney and Dirac. Uh, and we can also prove it using uh, freedom determinant formulas. It's not written yet, but I hope it's gonna be at some point, okay? So these, these formulas, the freedom determinant formula from which one can get convergence is the same freedom determinant formula from which we get uh, these these total equations, and that's what I'm going to show you in, in, in the rest of the talk, okay? What, one, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that even though if, if, you, if you knew about this result that uh, the KPZ fixed point uh, is related in this way to the KP equation, uh, in, in, if you know that, it's, then it's not surprising that TOTA has to, has to converge to KP. But as far as we know, 
uh, from the side of internal systems, uh, these convergences uh, have not appeared before. Okay, there was not direct der no direct derivation of uh, the, the, of the fact that you can get from these toad equations to KP or from the one D toad equations to KDD. So, so even that is new, and, and it's it's new because because it involves this very special scaling uh, from from which this is derived. So it's it's not so obvious how it converges. So if, if you sit down and try to do it. It really takes some effort, okay? And you can see that it's, it's something happening at very high order in, 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 in the expansions that one has to do. Okay, so as I was saying in the last part of my talk, I, I want to describe uh, the Fresnel determinant formula from where this comes. And hopefully I'm gonna have time to explain a little bit how this appears and, and what it has to do with PNG. Like really the dynamics have been lost for a while. I've just been showing formulas, but they're gonna come in again. So these equations come from these explicit Fresnel determinant formulas for this quantity here, these uh, transition probabilities or the uh, multipoint distributions of the PNG height function. Okay, so I am going to only talk about one point distributions simply because it makes my life easier, not because uh, any of what I'm going to say is really much harder with multi-point distribution. So everything is very similar, a little bit more complicated, but I'm gonna stick to one-point distributions. And to, okay, so these one-point distributions are gonna be given by a Fresnel determinant, which takes place in the space little l2 of z larger than r. So you don't really need to worry about that, K is a kernel, but I'm gonna tell you what the kernel is, but you can think of it as an infinite matrix, okay? So K is gonna be an infinite matrix. I is the identity, the, the infinite identity matrix, okay? I'm, and I'm gonna compute the determinant of this infinite matrix in the most natural way. That's what's called the Fretum determinant. And to say what this K is, uh, I need to introduce a little bit of notation. So first, uh, this NABLA operator, which is just a symmetric, discrete difference, f of x plus one minus f of x minus one. And then delta, which is gonna be the second discrete difference, f of x plus one minus two f of x uh, plus f of x minus one. Sorry, what is k? k? K, I'm going to tell you what k is. I'm uh -huh. just setting up the notation to tell you what, what k is, okay? So I have these two discrete operators and I am going to use this notation that x is a symmetric continuous time nearest neighbor random walk on Z. Okay, so it's of rate one. It's basically the difference of the difference of two Poisson processes. It's a, it's a process that jumps up at rate one and down at rate one. Notice that this uh, random walk has precisely this guy as its generator. That's the generator of that walk. Okay, so for now this is just notation, and I need one more piece of notation. So I'm going to introduce this kernel now. Think of it as a matrix, okay? So U and V are integers. And I'm going to compute something which we call P hit AB, evaluated at UV. And it is the following thing. So this blue path here, it's a path of the random walk. This green piece is H, that's the initial data. And all that I have to do is run my random walk started from you and ask, what is the probability that two things happen? Number one, that, okay, it started from you, that it ends at this V. But second, that along the way, it goes below the graph. It goes below, it, it goes into the hypograph. Okay, that's, that's why there's this hypo here. So it goes below the graph of the initial condition. Okay, so this is an explicit matrix, if you want. Okay, it's the probability that going from you, you end at V, but you uh, went below the hypograph of the function. It's a heating time problem for this random walk. Okay, so I don't have a formula, but it's probabilistically, it's completely explicit. Okay, so now I can tell you who's K. K is the following uh, operator or matrix, if you want. So you do the following thing. So it has two pieces or, or three pieces. So in the center, okay, on the outside, I have these guys here, which are just the semi-groups associated to these discrete difference operators in this way. Okay, so this is perfectly well-defined. And 
on the inside, I have this heat probability that I just uh, told you about, okay? And it's sort of conjugated again by these semigroups, okay? It's, it's a, if you want, it may be a little bit of a strange way to write it because you, you can see that I have an X here and an X there, and I could uh, cancel them. I have an X here and an, and an X there. I could also cancel them, but I'm not canceling them. And, and there's a reason I'm not canceling them. Uh, okay, so that's K. And it turns out that if you compute the determinant of the identity minus this matrix, then you get the probability, uh, the, the transition probabilities for this PNG process. Okay, so this is K. Yeah, I mean, a question here is where does this, uh, where on earth could this come from? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to explain give you an idea of how one can prove something like this. Okay, but this is the K. Be before saying that, let me tell you very briefly how one could get from, from a formula like this to this total lattice equation, okay? So this is K, here is K, the same K as in the previous uh, slide. Uh, and I'm gonna take this blue part and I'm gonna give it a name so that I don't have to write so much, okay? And you can notice the following thing. If I, if I for a while I forget all this, I, I, I want to compute this derivative of the kernel. I'm gonna take the kernel and I'm gonna compute the derivative. This is the derivative of, this is the differential operator that appeared in this toad equation, dt squared minus dx squared, okay? So I want to compute this. If I compute it, I'm gonna have things coming in from the three pieces, right? From here, from there, and from the blue part, because everything depends on t and everything depends on x. Now, if I forget about the blue part for a moment, then this is an easy computation, right? because I have exponential, I, I have the same group e to the minus two t, nabla, if I differentiate that in T, I'm gonna get a nabla in front, okay? And if I differentiate this part in T, I'm gonna get another nabla and so on. So that's easy. And if I forget about the blue part, I get this equation here, which is a simple equation for the kernel, okay? Now, it turns out that uh, in so the region blue where- So part, blue part is a operator or is a number? What is it? It's, it's an operator. If you want, this is, let, let, it acts, let me- It acts on functions. This, again, how, how this act? Because X and T fixed, yes? What is the operator? P. Okay, so- Notation is clear, isn't clear. Is it operation acting on functions on X or, or what? So this is, think of this as a matrix. In what space it acts as operator? Okay. Can you, can you say the last thing again? Because I couldn't. P. P in the center, the operator of, of odd number. P in the center. This, what? No, it's an operator. It's an operator. It's a matrix, if you want. It's an infinite matrix. Each of these pieces are infinite matrices. Okay? So K is a kernel in L2 of Z, but think of it as a matrix, if you want. And you're just multiplying these, these matrices. Okay? And the three depend on T and on X. So what I'm saying up to there is that if I pretend that the one in the center is not there, let me just pretend it's not there, uh, then computing the derivative is easy. It's, 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 it's just, it's basically, if you want, uh, differentiating a semigroup and I get the generator in front, okay? So that's, that's simple. And if you do it, you get this formula. You have to put everything together, but it's, this is really more or less direct, okay? Uh, and this gives me a nice equation for the kernel. That's the point. Uh, and then this, the blue part, which is another kernel, another operator, if you want, but just think of it as a matrix. Uh, it's complicated, but you can check it. This is this takes a little bit of work, but not it's not too complicated. You can check that this blue part actually doesn't contribute to the derivative. So I'm going to have a, a piece of the derivative coming from here, another one from there, and another one, and another one from there. But that one is not there. The one in the center doesn't contribute at all. Okay, so the conclusion that I get is that K satisfies this linear equation. And that's nice because if, if you think about it, I have this complicated nonlinear process uh, evolving this PNG, okay? Uh, and it's very complicated to say how it does it. But uh, if I look at this kernel K, then that kernel is evolving linearly in this way, okay? And then 
I, in principle, I could solve this solution, say, sorry, solve this, this evolution. I know who K is now. Now I take the freedom determinant and it gives me back F. So that's like a hallmark of integrability. I have sorry, comment. If, if you ignore the blue part, then everything is canceled. Hmm? No, it's not constant. Why? I, I, there's dependence on- Minus the two plus two, minus X plus X. Hmm? No, but this, this, sure, but these are matrices. So it's, there's no commutativity. So I get, <laughs> I, I get uh, for instance, when I, when I differentiate here- Exponent of minus something, exponent of plus the same. <laughs> Don't do it. No, but it, okay. So you get from this part, you get uh, uh, Laplacian or, or this delta, it's not a Laplacian on the left. And from this part, you get it on the right. So when I get a difference, since these are matrices, they don't commute, and, and there's no there's no uh, there's no cancellation. I really get there. Okay. So before trying to explain in maybe five minutes or so an idea of how one can prove this, uh, this Q. Now I can say who the Q was. The Q that appeared before. It's nothing but you take this matrix K. Okay. And you compute the inverse and you evaluate at these points R plus one. And that's the Q. And then if you compute uh, for a good couple of pages, uh, you do get, you get this total equation. Okay, so in the next talk, so, so I, I've been raising this question, where could such a formula come from? So the way we got the formula uh, originally is as a limit of something called discrete time tasted with parallel up. That's what, that's what Constantine is going to talk about and he's going to explain this in the next talk, okay? That's, that's how we discovered the formula. But it turns out that after knowing the formula, uh, there's, a, there's a way to explain where the formula comes from, uh, which is direct. So it doesn't require any complicated uh, algebraic derivations, which are the sort of thing one needs to get to these formulas for uh, this bit phase it. Uh, but I just take the formula, and what we can do is uh, check that the formula actually satisfies the backward equation for this process. Okay, so let me, and, and this is where the dynamics of PNG are gonna sort of come in, and, and hopefully you can see more or less what's going on. Okay, so I'm gonna give you a very, very rough sketch. The details are more complicated, uh, but the, the, the basic idea is the following. So, I have this F and I want to show you that it satisfies the Kolmogorov backward equations, okay? If it satisfies the Kolmogorov backward equation, then of course I need some uniqueness, but I'll just show you, show you that this satisfies the backward equation. So what I need to check is that if I compute the T derivative of F, so F is this distribution function, um, that is the same as applying the generator to F, okay? Now, who is the generator applied to? So the generator is applied to the configuration, if you want. And it's really to the initial condition. So think of this H here that I'm adding, so that H and that H. That's the initial condition for the process. And I compute what's the probability at time T. If I look at the process at A, X, it's going to be below R, starting from this H. And L is being applied to, uh, to this initial condition. And this is what I have to check. This is just the common of backward equation. OK? Now, maybe maybe let me skip this uh, quickly. So basically by, by properties, by relatively simple properties of the, of the generator uh, and by properties of the determinant, it turns out that if you want to show this, so show this identity, all I have to do is show the identity for the kernels, okay? And this is just, if, if you know how to differentiate a determinant, uh, you get some trace, things get a little bit more linear and you can check, and this, is, this is nothing very deep, uh, it's deep out the fact that we have a, a freedom determinant, but it's, it's, it's nothing to do uh, with, with the formula for the kernel, uh, that you all, all, all you need to check is the same equation for the kernels, okay? And remember, my kernel is fully explicit. I mean, it involves these hidden plants, but it's explicit. So this is what I have to check. Now, K, remember, is explicit. That's what I was saying. So I can compute the derivative, just as I showed in the, in the previous slide. Okay, same thing happens. So I, I compute the T derivatives. I get derivatives coming from here, derivatives coming from there. Okay, those are the, I'm not doing the computation. I'm just showing you uh, what happens. So I get these 
these graphs over there. And then there should be derivatives coming from the inside because this also depends on T, uh, but those go away. I don't need to worry about those, okay? They're, for all intents and purposes, there's zero, okay? So I get this formula, okay? This is DTK. And now I have to show that L of K equals the same thing, okay? Now L of K is more complicated, of course, because it involves uh, the dynamics. So, okay, I'm gonna apply L to K. Okay, this is my last slide. Uh, so I'm going to apply L to K. So K was this complicated operator, but remember L acts on H. And H in this whole operator, the only place where it appeared is in this P heat probability. Right? Everything else was these semigroups. And then there's this probability of heating below H for this random walk time going from X minus T to X plus T. So basically, this is all I have to compute, this LP hit, okay? L applied to this, to this probability. Now comes the key fact, something I haven't said yet. So the fact is the following, it's that this random walk, the law of this random walk, remember, X is just the difference of two Poisson processes. This random walk is essentially invariant under the PNG dynamics. So it's invariant modulo the fact that it's moving up. But if I just sort of recenter it, I just look at the, at the jumps, if you want, and not at, at the global height, it's invariant for the PNG dynamics. Uh, so this is something that requires a proof. But if you think about it, it's not so surprising, right? Because what I have is the, 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 the jumps, which are these steps up and down, are moving uh, uniformly with the speed. And if you, if you take a Poisson process and you move it a little bit, it's still a Poisson process, right? Uh, so that part is invariant. Now, what starts happening is that I have these collisions and that's gonna, in principle, it could kill the fact that I have a, a, a Poisson process, but these collisions get perfectly uh, counterbalanced by these creations. So uh, statistically, if you want, every time that I have a, a collision and, and one of these steps disappear, I have another one popping out. So, so this, this uh, law is invariant. Uh, okay, so that's interesting. And it turns out that it can be used, okay? So remember, I'm trying to compute L applied to this heat probability and L acts on H, okay? So this is what I'm trying to compute. And uh, on, on the next, I mean, in this equality, I'm just spelling out what it means. Uh, so P heat is the probability for this, so I'm calling G now this path, okay? It's, the, it's, it's a sample path if you want of this random walk. Uh, I start from U, I go to V and I have, have to hit H, okay? But now this is a step which uh, requires a little bit of thought, but uh, I ask you to believe me, uh, this problem has a lot of symmetry. Basically P and G, if I move it, if I move this evolution up or I move it down, it doesn't really change much. Uh, I mean, you see the same thing, but going backwards. Uh, so you can use that to check uh, by essential integration by parts that L applied, I mean, the, 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 the generator L applied to H in this function is the same as the generate, the adjoint of that generator applied to G. So I can pass the, all the dynamics that was being applied to H, remember H is the initial condition, and I can pass it to this G. G being this law. I mean, this is very schematic, but G is my, my, my random work, okay? Well, but L, the adjoint of L is just the generator of the backwards dynamics. And my random work is invariant, right? So if it's invariant for the forward dynamics, it's also invariant for the backward dynamics, okay? So now essentially what I have here is that uh, I, I'm applying this generator to a function which is integrated against the invariant measure. And if I do that, uh, I should get zero, right? That's the definition of being invariant. So I'm applying L star to, uh, I'm computing integral of the generator applied to some function integrated against the, the invariant measure. Uh, well, that would be the case if my path was completely free if it really was the free random walk, the one that's invariant. But this one is not free because I'm conditioning it to go from U 
to be. So it, it's, it's been conditioned. It's not really the, the it's, it's, it's a bridge measure, if you want. It's not really a bridge. It's, it's, it's not conditioned. Let me, let me say it that way. Uh, okay, so I don't get exactly zero. What's going to happen is that due to this conditioning, I'm going to get some uh, boundary con some boundary terms. And if you compute the boundary terms, uh, this is a computation. You get exactly what you need, which is this. Okay, so this is this is what I needed in the in the earlier slide. Th this was essentially what shows up in uh, the time derivative of k. So so maybe to to try to put it together uh, by the reason why the kernel that appears in this formula is a kernel involving uh, the heating times of this uh, sort of symmetric Poisson random walk is that that symmetric Poisson random walk uh, corresponds basically to the invariant measure of the process. So that's what's behind uh, this appearance. And that's the sort of thing you would need. You can sort of use that to, to leverage it to, to prove the, the formula. So then you get the from the terminal formula and from there, uh, show uh, follow on the one hand convergence to a KPC fixed point and also if you want um, these total equations. Okay, so with that I'm going to finish and I thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Daniel. So are there any questions? The audience. I have one question if I may. Of course. Thanks. Um, basically, the question relates to the random matrix distributions at the start and some connections to the actual derivation. You were showing Gaussian unitary ensemble, and then I probably one could link, maybe un understood this wrong, also to the airy two process and then to the two-dimensional total lattice equation. And similarly, for the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble, finally to the one-dimensional total lattice. Could anything similar be done also for the Gaussian symplectic ensembles, the third part of this general beta ensemble trio, when um, beta is one, two, and four? Yes, so uh, I mean, not in the context of PNG. I don't think. I mean, I don't think it, this has been studied. Well, basically, so no. Actually, basically, yes. So the, the this GSC shows up. So the, the, the GU, the Gaussian unitary ensemble, uh, shows up in this narrow wedge initial condition case. The yes. Gaussian orthogonal. It's for the flat. The GSC shows up basically when the, when you look at these models in a half line. Okay. So so. Okay. Some version of this on a half line, uh, there you, there it's known that the, the GSC appears. Okay, and yeah, presumably in PNG one could do something like that. And there's there's uh, work on uh, versions of uh, random permutations uh, by Gino Bike and Eric Rains and people like them, uh, where where this sort of thing uh, show up. Okay, not in the context of, I mean, in the context of random growth, it has also shown up. Uh, but we, it hasn't shown up in, in this version uh, yet. Okay, thanks. And is there any connection to other betas in terms of the ensembles? Is there any research on this? Probably not, but well, like, like six yeah, or... Yeah, so that, that's, that's a very natural question. And I, I, okay. I don't think they are. I mean, nobody knows. Uh, nobody okay. has found any connection, uh, any direct connection. Like you can deform things and make some sort of tangent connections. Uh, but it's, sure. the other betas seem not to show up in, in, in these sort of processes. As far as we know. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Are there any other questions? If not, I, I propose that we thank, uh, we, we unmute ourselves and we thank uh, Daniel for, for this wonderful talk. <laughs> And uh, let us give a five minute break to, to have some coffee. Or, and then we start with uh, Constantine. Um, perhaps three minutes. So we start at 10 past. Yes. So 10 past, uh, so three minutes. Yes. So we'll go to look uh, for a coffee. Thank you. 
Just in time. Uh, Daniel blocked me in the <laughs> corridor. Good. So shall we start? Uh, okay. Uh, so, so thank you very much for staying for the second part of this uh, joint talk. So we have uh, now the pressure to have with us uh, Konstantin Mateski from Columbia University, who will be giving the second part of this talk about the exact resolvable determinantal processes in the KPC universality class. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to give a talk in the seminar. Um, so I'm going to talk about a joint work with Jeremy Costello and Daniel Remenick about some determinantal process in the KPC universality class. So in Daniel's talk, uh, he showed a formula for the multipoint distribution of the PNG model, polynuclear growth. And he showed that if you know this, this formula, you can check that it satisfies a Kolmogorov equation. But uh, so I, in my talk, I'm going to explain how to derive formulas like this. Uh, so roughly speaking, we developed in our work, we developed a method how to derive similar formulas for a quite general class of uh, determinantal point processes. And in some particular cases, this determinantal, the marginal distributions of this process gives, give some non interacting particle systems. And in particular, it gives a formula which Daniel showed for the polynuclear growth. Okay, so let me start with talking about the KPZ universality. Uh, so in general, we're interested in uh, describing the, uh, the fluctuations of random growing interfaces. So roughly speaking, uh, we have a random growing interface H, uh, which evolves in time C, and for each C, it gives a function in the spatial variable X. Okay. Uh, so it has some random fluctuations, it evolves in time and under quite general assumptions uh, on, this, on this evolution, we expect to observe uh, non-trivial one to three fluctuations. 
So what it means is the following. If we take a small parameter epsilon and we rescale space, time, and the size of fluctuations of the height function h using the so-called one to three rescaling, if we subtract probably the asymmetry, the deterministic trend from, from the evolution, and when epsilon goes to zero, we expect to see a non-trivial limit. So this non-trivial limit is a random function, which again uh, depends on two variables, space and time. So when this non-trivial limit exists, uh, it is called the KPT fixed point. And for HT, it is a function on a certain space of upper semi-continuous uh, functions. So for the first time for, for general initial state, uh, the KPT fixed point was constructed in my joint work with Jeremy Costello and Daniel Remenik in 2017. And the KPT fixed point is conjectured to be the universal limit of many models in the KPT universality class of many models, which are described by such random growing interfaces. Um, so to characterize the KPT fixed point, we worked with a very special model in the KPC universality, TASEP. So I'm going to introduce it on the next slide. Uh, but basically, we we work with a uh, with a, one of the exactly solvable models and determinantal. So what it means is that we have a model for which we can compute exactly the multipoint distribution function. And this this formula for the multipoint distribution function comes in 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 a form of a Fredholm determinant. So this allowed us to uh, take the scaling limit and characterize the KPD fixed point using the multipoint distribution functions. Um, so let me start with introducing TASEP, and then a bit later I will I will talk about some other variants of, of this model. So TASEP stands for totally symmetric symbol exclusion process, and uh, the description is very simple. We look at particles on the integer lattice. So in this picture, the bl black dot is a particle. Uh, if there is no black dot, the site is empty. So there is always at most one particle per site. Each site is either empty or occupied by one particle. And the particles uh, try to jump independently to the right in the continuous time. Um, so the restriction on the jump is that particles are not allowed to, to jump on top of each other. So there should be always one, at most one particle per side. So for example, in this picture, if we have these four particles, the third particle is not allowed to jump on the top of the second. But on the other hand, if the fourth particle decides to jump to the right, it is allowed to do it. So in the next time, the fourth particle just moves, makes a unit step to the right. Okay, so for each configuration of particles, we can associate a height function, uh, in a very simple way, it is a function which makes unit steps up and down depending on whether the uh, site is occupied by a particle or empty. So we have this blue curve, which is a height function. And then when uh, one of these particles jump to the right, the respective local minimum turns into a local maximum. Okay, so, so when one time evolves, uh, the height function grows up and local minima independently try to turn to local maxima. Um, so for every special initial states, the asymptotic analysis of this, of this model was performed quite long ago. Uh, I think the first result was by Kurt Johansson in 2002 for half packed initial state when all, this, all the sides to the left of the origin are occupied and all the sides to the right are empty. And in 2006, by Baradin, Fischer, Prekhoff, and Sasamoto, they obtained a form of this model for periodic initial condition, particle hole, particle hole, particle hole, and so on. And this allowed them to characterize the scaling limit uh, for, for, for this special initial condition. So in our work with Daniel and Jeremy, uh, we obtained a formula for TASEP for arbitrary initial condition at time zero. And this is what allowed us to characterize the scaling limit, the KPG fixed point. So in fact, now work we developed some method, uh, 
how to compute marginal distributions of certain uh, determinant of point processes. And somehow this method didn't really care that there is taste step behind. So we didn't really care about the interacting particle system. What was important that there is a certain determinant of point process. And in my joint work with Daniel, we generalized our method to some larger class uh, of determinant of point processes. So in particular cases of these determinant of point processes, the marginals give uh, non interacting particle systems. So one of them is TASEP, and uh, some of them are some, for example, discrete time variants of TASEP, which I'm going to talk about a bit later. And in particular, from this, from this uh, more general result, we are able to produce the formulas for the distribution function of the PNG model, which Daniel talked about. So uh, before going into details, I want to introduce a couple of other models, which in some sense have a similar structure of TASEP. But so first let me let me tell you what is so special about TASEP, which allowed us to perform our analysis. Um, so the transition probabilities of TASEP can be computed exactly, and they're given in terms of determinants. So what I mean is the following. If we take n particles of TASEP, we label them from left to right, uh, then the probability to go from one configuration Y to another configuration X during time T is given by a determinant of an N by N matrix. Okay, so the entries in, inside this matrix are given explicitly in terms of a function and this function f is written as a contour integral. And for some inside the contour integral, the structure of the function is like this for some particular choices of the function phi and the function a. So the same formula was proved for several other interacting particle systems, some modifications of TASEP. So sometimes they, these formulas come as a determinant. Sometimes they come as a determinant with a prefactor which can depend on X. And this is a prefactor which, which just turns this determinant into the probability distribution. But anyway, so in any case, in, in every case, we have a formula like this in, of, in terms of a determinant of an N by N matrix. Uh, so we call this formula Schutz type because the first result of this form was obtained by Schutz in 1997. He computed this transition probabilities for TASEP in continuous time. And he obtained this formula for the choices of A and phi, as you, as you can see here. Okay, so later in 2007, uh, there was a paper by Dicker and Warren in which they used the robinson shenson knut correspondence to derive a formula of the same type for some other discrete time models. Uh, some, some discrete time variants of TASEP, some of them I, I will introduce in the next slide. Also, there were some other interesting models for which a formula like this was proved. So for example, the, there is a model push ASEP uh, by Baradin Ferrari in 2007. And there is some TASEP with generalized uh, update uh, for which the same formula holds and which was proved in 2012. So in other words, uh, we wanted to develop some general method which was able to cover all these known interacting particle systems. Um, so let me introduce a couple of these models uh, for which the formulas are known. So the simplest one is a discrete time variant of TASEP. Uh, so in this model, the particles jump to the right with Bernoulli distribution with, Bernou uh, with probability P and with probability Q, which is equal to one, one minus P, they stay uh, at, the same, at the same location. So the interaction between particles is blocking, meaning that again, a particle is not allowed to jump on top of another particle. And when we have discrete time, to go from time t to t plus one, we have different choices how to update the particles. So there are two natural updates. If you update particles from right to left or from left to right. Uh, 
So when we update from right, right to left, uh, this is so-called sequential update. Then again, we get the shoots, shoots type formula with these choices of the functions a and phi. If you update from left to right, this is called parallel taste step. Then again, the shoots, shoots type formula holds, but now a and phi are slightly different. Um, so another interesting model is again in discrete time where particles make Bernoulli jumps to the left, but now the interaction is pushing. So it means that if a particle is trying to jump on top of another one on its left, then the left particle is just pushed to the left so that again, particles don't stay on top of each other. Okay, this is called push interaction. And again, the if, if you consider the sequential update from right to left, uh, the shoots type formula holds with this choice of the functions a and phi. Um, so another interesting examples are discrete time taste step with geometric jumps. Again, we can define uh, particles which jump with geometric distributions to right and left, and the interaction is given by uh, pushing and blocking. So for pushing, uh, oh, sorry, for blocking, the choice of a and phi is like this. Uh, for pushing is like this. So as I said, there are some other known models for which should type formal holds and the choice of a and phi are, uh, are different. So in general, if you take arbitrary functions a and phi and you put into the Schutz type formula, it is very difficult to say whether it defines a, 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 an evolution of, of particles. Um, yeah, but for some, for some special choices of a and phi, we know that uh, there is a dynamics described by the Schutz's formula. So for all these particles, which I mentioned, if we have a Schutz type formula, we can compute a distribution function of a particle. So in what follows, I will always write formulas for one point distribution, uh, meaning that for this for the distribution function of one particle. So we also have similar formulas for multi-point distributions, but in order to write them, I will need to introduce some more notation and I just don't want to make everything more complicated. So I will always use one point distribution function. Uh, so for all these models, the one point distribution function is given in form of a Fred Horn determinant where the kernel inside of Fred Horn determinant depends on the parameter on the left. It depends on C time variable and the number of particle and X naught, which is the initial configuration of particles at time zero. So what is special is that we know the structure of this kernel in the, in the determinant. Sorry, what is X T of N? What is this under variable? How it's connected with the process? X T of N, in the first formula. Yeah, yeah, so, so this is configuration of particles at time T, X T, and then N is the number of particle. This is the N's particle at time T. N's particle at time T, thank you. Welcome. So in all these cases, we know the structure of the kernel. It is always given in the following form. It is the sum of products of some functions psi and phi. So the functions psi, these are those functions which appear in the Schutz's formula. So they are known explicitly, we have formulas for them, but then the functions phi, they are characterized implicitly. So we know that they are polynomials which are bar orthogonal to psi. So meaning that, meaning that for every k and l, if we take this convolution of psi and phi, we get an indicator that k is equal to l. So first, this characterization of the kernel in this bi-orthogonal form was derived by Baradin, Ferrari, Perkhoff, and Samot in 2006. Uh, first was derived for TASEP in continuous time, but then later it was derived also for some other variants of TASEP. Uh, so the problem now boils down to computing this functions phi because now from this uh, identity they are given implicitly. 
And these guys managed to characterize the functions phi only for special initial states, for, the, for example, for the periodic initial state, when we have particle hole, particle hole, particle hole, and so on. So in our work with Jeremy and Daniel, first we completely characterized the functions phi for arbitrary initial state for TASEP, continuous time TASEP. And then uh, in the joint work with Daniel, we did it for, for all other models. So in fact, initially in our work, we didn't consider the interacting particle systems. We were interested in a general solution of this biosignalization problem. Let's say given, given known functions psi in the form which I wrote before, the, some general functions psi, the question was, can we compute the functions phi? And we did it in a quite big generality. And then for special choices of the, of the functions psi, we obtained the formulas for the interacting particle systems, which I talked about. Basically, we, we derived formulas for all interacting particle systems of these types, which we were able to find. Um, so I don't want to describe the solution, th this form of the kernel K in, uh, in, in, in full generality, but I will talk only about the parallel TASEP because this is the model which leads to the polynuclear growth. So for parallel TASEP, uh, the kernel K is given in this form. So it is a composition of four kernels. So you should think that each of these kernels, R, Q, and so on, this are infinite dimensional matrices uh, parameterized by integer points. So you just have a product of four matrices. So what are these matrices? So R is given by this contour integral. The matrix Q, is given by the following formulas. So when x, uh, when the dif distance between x and y is greater than two, then uh, q looks like a geometric distribution, just some power of some parameter of theta. But when when the distance between x and y is, is equal to one, we have some extra constant in front. Uh, so the parameter of theta in this formula can be taken arbitrary it is irrelevant what is the value of theta on the discrete level, but it is important what is it when we take the limit. So you should always think that theta is a density of uh, particles at time zero. So for example, if you have the configuration particle hole, particle hole, particle hole, then theta will be the density one half. The constant alpha is the one which turns Q into a probability kernel, so that it sums to one. So the matrix Q defines a transition kernel of a random walk with these distributions. Uh, so in particular, we can uh, define the transition probability of this random walk from some point X to some point Y during N steps so that on its way, it goes above X naught. So X naught is the curve which is uh, defined by the initial configuration of particles and the random walk, we look at the probability that the random walk goes above this curve. So this probability we denote, we call P hit, and then uh, this probability can be, so this is, a, this is a function in X and Y, it can be extended analytically in the Y variable. So this analytic uh, continuation we call P hit bar, and this is the one which appears in the formula for the kernel for the parameter. Sorry, analytic continuation in what parameter? In y. But y is discrete, no? Uh, right, that's, that's a good point. So what I mean is that we have a polynomial in y. So it can, ah. be, it can be extended polynomially in the y variable. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, um, so for all other models, uh, the kernel in the Fredholm determinant has kind of the same the same structure, but this uh, operators are on left and right, they are more complicated. And then the random walk which is involved is also more complicated. And uh, what is the need to continue it? If it's polynomial, then it's defined for all y? 
What do we mean? What is continuation? Uh, sorry, can you say it again? Why you need to, to to make continuation if this this quantity is given for all x and y? Yes. Uh, continuation. Uh, sorry, let me see. Oh, okay, so yeah, so to be more precise, we we'll look we we'll look we we'll look at this uh, at this at this probability when y is below the curve, and then in the, when in, y is what below the curve x not. So we look at this probability when when y is restricted to stay below the curve, and then and then after that we need to extend it polynomially to to all the other. Ones. Why is that? Is, what is what is with y? I don't 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 not hear you. What why? Uh, so, so this this formula where I write probability for the random walk to go from x to y. Yes. So we have this probability only for y below the curve, and, and, and then after that we, we show that we can extend it polynomially to all the other y's. Okay. Thank you. And so we need to consider this polynomial continuation because this is how the formula comes to us. So. Uh, so this biosingularization biosingularization problem requires phi to be polynomials, and okay. So more or less, this is the same as saying that we we need to extend this heat probability polynomially in the y variable. Okay, so now I want to explain how to go from the parallel taste step to the PNG growth. Um, so let me. First, uh, remind you what is the evolution of the height function for the parallel taste step. Again, so we have particles on the integer lattice. Now I build the height function so that uh, with time it evolves down. So each local maximum try, tries to turn to a local minimum independently of the other local maxima with probability p. And then I define a new function capital H, which is simply C plus the height function for the parallel taste step. So the one, one step evolution of this new function H, I, so I call it approximate PNG because this is the one which gives us PNG in the limit. So the one point evolution of, of, of this uh, approximate PNG is the following. In the first step, uh, the height function makes just a unit shift up everything is shifted up and then after that uh, each local maximum tries to turn it to a local minimum with probability p okay so this is the evolution of the approximate png and then it is not very difficult to imagine if you think of it that if we rescale time and space by one over square root of q and we take q to zero, then we get the limit, which is exactly given by the evolution of the PNG model described by Daniel. Um, okay, so what happens if you think about the pictures from the previous slide is the following. If we have a part of the profile of the discrete function, which is goes up, down, up, down, up, down, then after this uh, scaling limit, if, if you have this, long interval of ups and downs after the in the limit it becomes a flat curve just constant curve horizontal curve and if you have uh, sufficiently long uh, diagonal lines up or down they respectively become uh, vertical lines up or down okay so meaning that each configuration of this discrete function, each profile of this discrete function in the limit becomes a function which is piecewise constant. It can be described by uh, constant pieces connected by vertical lines. And the Q, sorry, Q is one minus P? Yes, Q is one, Q is one minus P. Okay, thank you. And then, uh, so if you think what happens with on this picture, so when Q is small, it means that P is big. So each local maximum, with high probability turns into a local minimum. But still, it may happen that with, with low probability, some of this maximum doesn't turn into a local minimum. And this exactly corresponds to the nucle nucleations in the polynuclear growth. 
So in other words, the evolution of the PNG in the limit can be described as follows. We have a height function with, uh, which is piecewise constant and each vertical uh, segment uh, grows horizontally with a unit speed deterministically. So when two vertical segments meet, then they just, this, this collapse just disappears and the, the growth continues in a natural way. But sometimes uh, nucleations happen. So with intensity two, some new vertical unit jumps appear. And then these unit jumps just start, start immediately growing deterministically in the horizontal direction. So if, if we have a profile like this, then after some short time, it becomes like this. Okay, so this is the PNG model which, which Daniel described. Um, so now I'm going to tell you, yeah, so if, if you know a formula for the parallel taste step, uh, then by taking this limit, we obtain the respective formula for the PNG model. And it happens that under, under this rescaling limit, uh, the parts of the, of the discrete kernel for PNG, they more or less converge to the respective parts uh, for, for uh, sorry, the parts for the, for the discrete parallel to step, they converge more or less in the same way to the respective parts of PNG. So uh, I just re recall that we have this one point formal for PNG where the kernel is given in this form. Uh, so, sorry, this is a form of parallel to step. So we choose a suitable rescaling of the variable. Time is rescaled like this. The particle number is rescaled like this. And the uh, variable in the kernel inside this determinant is rescaled like this. So if we uh, conjugate the kernel by a suitable power, then when, when Q goes to zero, we can show that convergence of the kernels holds in trace class. And what we obtain in the limit is the kernel for the PNG model. And the convergence, so, so when, we, when, when we prove such convergences, it always happens that pointwise convergence is quite, quite easy to show. We can always guess what the limit is, but then to have convergence of kernels and trace class, uh, this, this requires some significant, significant amount of work. But what happens when I prove this convergence is that the objects for the parallel TSEP get replaced by some respective objects for PNG. So for example, the random walk with a transition kernel QN is replaced by a random walk in continuous time generated by the uh, discrete Laplacian. Okay, so this is the random walk which, which Daniel talked about. It's a difference of two Poissonian, uh, Poissonian processes of intensity two. So this random walks in continuous time just makes Poissonian jumps, independent Poissonian jumps up and down. Uh, so all the other operators are replaced by some uh, by some analogs. So for example, R is replaced by an operator generated by the discrete uh, derivative and the discrete Laplacian. And then the inverse of R is, is, is replaced by the respective operator. So more or less all the parts of the discrete kernel are replaced by some analogs of, uh, uh, by some limiting analogs. So what we obtain is, is in the limit is the following. So the one point distribution for PNG is given by the Fredholm determinant where the kernel is given in this form. Uh, so it is conjugated by on two sides by some semi-groups generated by, by discrete Laplacian and, and, and discrete Nabla. And inside it has a scattering transform. So the heat probability for the random walk conjugated on two sides by uh, two semi-groups generated by the discrete Laplacian. And the heat probability is the limiting heat probability uh, for the parallel to step. So now we have this random walk with uh, Poissonian jumps. We look at the probability that it goes from point U1 to U2 on the time interval between X minus T to X plus T. 
and we condition the uh, we look at the probability that on this time interval it hits it goes below the uh, function uh, for the PG, P and G at time zero. So for example, here, it, the random walk goes from U1 to U2 and it hits the curve, the blue curve. It goes below the blue curve. <coughs> um, so as Daniel said, the PNG model, uh, yeah, so, so I should say that Mm, the formula for the PNG model before our work was known only for special initial condition when the initial profile at time zero was either narrow wedge or flat zero at all uh, in, in the whole space. So uh, in our work, we derived the formula for arbitrary initial condition at time zero. And as I said, I always write the one point distribution function because it's just easier to write, but we have analogous formula formulas for multi-point distributions of the PNG, of the PNG model. So as Daniel said, the PNG model belongs to the KPZ universality class. So it means that if we apply the one to three rescaling to the PNG height function, if we remove the global deterministic drift, uh, deterministic growth up, which is in this case two epsilon minus one T then when epsilon goes to zero, we obtain convergence to the KPZ fixed point. Uh, so this is an ongoing work with, with Daniel and Jeremy. So for convergence of, um, con so convergence, um, pointwise convergence of the kernels is easy to show. And of course the challenge is to prove that the kernels converge in the trace, in the trace norm. And again, something similar happens what happened when we, when we go from TASEP to PNG. So when we rescale the variables, then all the components of the kernels in the pre-limiting determin determinant are replaced by analogous limiting components uh, in the limit. So what it means is the following. If we rescale the variables like this, so we scale time, we rescale space, we rescale UI, the variables inside the home determinant, then when we take the limit epsilon goes to zero, the random walk generated by the discrete Laplacian is replaced by random walk generated by the uh, continuous. So how X connected with the XI? There's X and XY. Yeah, oh yeah, yes, the scale. Sorry, sorry, sorry the, there is a little confusion. Uh, So X is a variable which is a replaceable at. Okay, so let's look one, one again. So we, we look at the PNG at the bold X. So in the limit, the bold X will be replaced by this X. So the KPG fixed point will be evaluated this X. But then the variables inside the Fred Home determinant UI will be replaced by XI. Yeah. So, so this xi is a variable which will be inside the Friedhorn determinant in the limit. Oh, thank you. Yeah, sorry for the confusion. I shouldn't use, I shouldn't use the same names. Um, yeah. So, so what I was saying that the random walk in the limit is 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 getting replaced by a Brownian motion with diffusivity with diffusivity two, and the discrete uh, semi groups generated by. Uh, discrete Nabla and discrete Laplacian get replaced by respective semi-groups generated by continuous differential operators. Okay, it is not completely obvious why, but for example, this operator gets replaced by the operator generated by the second and third derivatives. Okay, so uh, the operator generated by the second derivative is, a, is the hit, uh, heat operator and the area, uh, uh, um, the operator generated by the third derivative is uh, an integral uh, operator whose kernel is given by the area function. So in other words, the kernel for this operator can be written explicitly as some, some transformation of the area function. In particular, it is well-defined and it makes sense. Uh, so the scattering transform 
for the random walk is replaced by the scattering transform for the Brownian motion, but this transition becomes uh, becomes non-trivial because so here we have the heat and heat probability on a finite time interval, but then when we take the limit, uh, the KPT scaling limit, this interval goes to infinity. So in in some sense, the scattering transform is given by the heat probability on the whole real line from minus infinity to plus infinity, but in order to compensate the growth of the Brownian motion to infinities, it has to be uh, the the heat probability has to be convolved uh, from both sides by respective semigroups, which which compensate this growth of the of the Brownian motion. So it is not completely clear why the limit of the scattering transformation makes sense, but it can be shown that in fact it is defined as a uh, as an operator, so that the whole kernel uh, is a trace class. So in other words, when we compute this limit, we obtain the following. The one point distribution function for the KPT fixed point is given by a Fred Horn determinant where the kernel inside the Fred Horn determinant is given by the scattering transformation uh, inside, which is, as I said before, it's given by the, in terms of the heat and probability of a Brownian motion on the whole interval from minus infinity to plus infinity, and it, it hits the hypograph of the H naught, which is the profile of the KPD fixed point at time zero. And the scattering transformation is conjugated from both sides by the semigroup generated by second and third derivatives, which is, as I said, some uh, integrable uh, integral operators whose kernel are given by some transform transformed uh, uh, area functions. Yeah, so the, as I said, um, a similar convergence result and the similar formulas hold for multipoint distributions of P and G and the KPG fixed point. So what we obtain is the convergence, the finite um, the convergence of multi-point distributions for P and G to, multi to respective multi-point distributions of the KPD fixed point. And so as soon as the KPD fixed point is defined well, this convergence uh, implies the weak convergence on the level of processes. The P and G convergence to the KPD fixed point. And I will stop at this point. Uh, thank you very much, Konstantin. Uh, so other, yes. Thank you. So are, are there any questions? So, so I had one. So it, it somehow surprising in the in the uh, in the slide before. So when uh, what how do you so so you would expect just from the point two that you would get like just one derivative? Why is there a third derivative? What's the intuition that you are? Um Okay, this is not very obvious from the way I write it here. So what happens is that, okay, so let, let's see. T is, okay, okay, so may, may, maybe better it will be, it will be said like this. Okay, so the X delta converges to the second derivative. This is not surprise, right? Yes. But then, so what happens to the first part? In the first part, T is scaled by this very, very large prefactor epsilon to the minus three half. Uh -huh. But then when, when we evaluate this kernel on the variables U and these variables U are also rescaled by this very large prefactor. So it means that this epsilon to the minus three half, it appears in T, but it appears also in the points at which we evaluate the kernel. Yes. And then, Okay, this is not very obvious to see why, but these two guys, they cancel out and the first derivatives. So, so, so first of all, they are chosen in exactly the, same, the way that the first derivative here uh, just, just disappears and what happens is the third, the third one. Okay, so it is... Uh, okay. 
Yeah, because but because the gradient is just the difference in in two neighboring points, no? Right, 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 right. Yes. But but then, oh, okay. So you you should think that you you have a you have a discrete kernel, and then you just expand this discrete kernel in kind of a Taylor expansion, and then the first the first derivative just disappears, and what stays is the next one. And the next one happens to be the third one. Yes. And, yeah. and, that, and does this kernel generate like a like a Markov process also? Like just this, this exponential, because like the exponential of a minus Laplacian feels like like a Brownian motion. And you have something similar here? Uh, Markov process. Like a Brownian motion type of thing. No, this is something more complicated. Uh, so you, you, you should think that this operator when you apply to a function it is given by the integral operator with the kernel like if, if you just have the second derivative you will convolve a function with the heat kernel but here when you apply this whole operator you convolve the function with something much more complicated this this kernel which you obtain here is given by some quite complicated modification of the area function okay Thank you. So are there any other questions? Um, may I ask a question? Yes. Hello. I hear. Um, thank you for a nice talk. Um, I also have a question regarding this part, but I would like to ask the question on the slide of when you introduced uh, the discrete model, the uh, parallel T set solution to that. The solution uh, to here? Yes, here. Yes. So basically the way I see it is you have the probabilistic interpretation of your matrix Q and also your matrix P hit. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and uh, I know that mathematically all these objects are Q and the P, you have very nice limiting operator in the slide that just we discussed. But how or how should I think of this matrix, uh, matrix R here? Is there, or they are, you know, no, the, those those don't. Or they are what they are, or should I have a better interpretation? Because mathematically the formula works, I know that part, but. Um, no, I'm afraid there is, there is no like a beautiful, mm -hmm. or there is no beautiful interpretation. This is just some kernels which you need to use to conjugate the, mm -hmm. the probability. Okay, yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Sorry, what does it mean for any theta and alpha? It's uh, depend on theta or alpha. Oh, it is, for, it, it is for any theta, but then for alpha such that uh, the the Q is is a is a is a probability distribution. And and the result doesn't depend on theta probability. Yeah, so the discrete the discrete formula doesn't de doesn't depend on theta. Uh -huh. So we. Uh, so, so more or less when we introduce the theta, it is the same as to conjugate the kernel inside the Fred Horn determinant by powers of theta. This mm. conjugation doesn't change the kernel. So on the on the discrete level, the theta doesn't play much role. So it, it is it is it is involved in the definition of the random walk, but we can choose any theta we want. We can take it to be one half, for example. Mm. But it is important which theta you take when you when you find the scale and limit, because this theta, uh, yeah, yeah. So, so basically, if if you take the the wrong value of theta, the scaling limit does you don't get the scaling limit. So the theta should be taken exactly uh, to be equal to the density of particles at time zero. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. yeah. So the value of theta is important for the scaling limit, but not for the discrete formula. Mm. Thank you. Oh, Andrei had a question? Yes, Thanks. yes. Uh, it's a general question, but you relate to exactly solvable determinantal processes. Uh, so exactly which uh, interacting particle systems is this applicable to, and could it be extended to others uh, in the KPC universality class, actually? Well, sure. So as I said, given uh, okay, let me go back. Okay, so for example, if, if, if you go back here, so if I take 
this determinant uh, for just some arbitrary functions a and phi, it is very difficult to show that it corresponds, it defines some dynamics of particles. Okay, so you, you can show that, for example, this is a probability distribution, this determinant defines a probability distribution. But so what is the dynamic? This is very difficult to say. Um, so in our work, we considered just this general bar synchronization problem. So this bar synchronization problem makes sense for arbitrary A and phi. Okay, not, not arbitrary, but sufficiently nice A and I. And we solve this bar synchronization problem more or less for general A and, A and phi. But then, of course, it's very difficult to go back. So given, given the solution, given the Fred Horn determinant like this for the kernel, it's very difficult to say if it corresponds to a dynamic or not. So what we had to do is we had to basically look through the literature to find all the possible interaction particle systems for which the formula, the formula knows. And then, and then our solution covers all these all this models which I mentioned like this. They said discrete time they said and push I said and some generalized convolution. So we also discovered some some other interacting interacting particle systems which also fall into this into this framework and which were not known before. But yeah, as I said, it's very difficult to get from the determinant of formula to to the particle system. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? So if not, I, I ask uh, you to, I ask all of us to unmute ourselves so we can uh, thank uh, Constantine and Daniel for the nice uh, talks. <laughs>